why I'm standing here instead of Justin. Uh, maybe some of you already know. Uh, Justin come into contact with a person that tested positive for COVID on Thursday, so he has to quarantine himself for a little while. Um, he did not enter this building after that contact, so the building is, is clear. We're going to see him, though. He has prepared video for us that we're going to see him in just a, a little bit. So I just want to welcome you this morning. Glad you come out in this nice, sunny Super Bowl day. And uh, this will be a blessed time together. Let's just pray, and then we'll continue worship. Father God, we do thank you, Lord, for your goodness and for your faithfulness and for your loving kindness, Lord, and that we can come to you with all of our issues in life, our troubles and, and our illnesses and everything that, that we experience, Lord, we can come to you. And Lord, we can, but more precious than anything is we can rejoice with you, Lord. We can rejoice in your goodness. And that's what we want to do today. We want to lift up your name. We want to praise you. And we want to enjoy our fellowship together. So we just ask that you be with us this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dan. I'm going to invite you to stand with us once again as we continue to worship the Lord. Let's open up with Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise Him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to Him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all He does. Amen. Thank you. 
to shelter like no other. Your name, let the nations sing it louder. There's nothing has power to say. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name. Jeff. So this morning we're going to be testing, uh, this is going to be a little different with the technology. We're going to splice here just in just a, just a moment. Um, first of all, I'd like to just remind everyone that there is a, a container in the back there if you would like to give this morning. And for the, those of you who are watching from TV land, um, you can give online, that's our, our address there. We, um, we do believe, like Justin always says, and we've, we've said this for many, many years, we do believe it's the work of the church to support the church. Uh, so we, we encourage you to worship in your giving. So with that, uh, I think we'll just go ahead because, because we, um, Justin is gonna lead the rest of the service. I'll, to say goodbye to you when we're all done here, but we're going to see how this works. So, Stephen, it's up to you. Hello, church. Welcome back to my living room. Uh, I'm sure there's already been an announcement made today, but I just want to make clear um, the situation going on and why you're watching me on video instead of uh, having me in person at the church today. Um, so earlier this week, or really late this week, I was exposed to someone who ended up testing positive for COVID, um, and so they had COVID but didn't know it. They were asymptomatic at the time that I was around them, um, and so I need to quarantine for 14 days because I could possibly have uh, COVID now. Right now, I have no symptoms, um, no indication that I actually do have it, but just want to, to be cautious. I want to come to church and spread it all to you. Um, I was not at the church building anytime after I interacted with this person and so um, there's no extra risk for anybody that's there and it was you know like coughing on things or um, you know breathing all over everything there or anything like that so I'm uh, just gonna gonna uh, stay here at home uh, for the next couple of weeks um, and look forward to, to seeing you all again real soon um, you can pray for us and for our family but especially pray for the person that I, that I contacted it for uh, was in contact with I'm more concerned really about their health than my own health so um, the biggest prayer for me is just how to continue to pastor uh, uh, from home on a 14-day quarantine so um, yeah I love you guys thank you guys for being flexible um, and with that um, let's go ahead and dive into our message so we're going to continue today uh, in the book of Philippians but before we start in Philippians I just want to ask a question and this is going to be a hard message to preach because I had a lot of questions where I wanted to go back and forth with you guys, but I don't get to do that so much. But I'm going to ask this question and just leave you a couple minutes to talk about with the people around you. Just put up a blank screen for a minute. 
I will come back. Um, but the, the question is, is what are some American values? If you were just to make a list of American values, what would you say that they are? So go ahead and take a minute, talk to people around you, and we'll gather back up in just a minute. All right, go ahead and come on back. Um, so uh, I was hoping to solicit your answers and get your answers to this. Um, I, I kind of did some uh, Google searches and wrote down the things that came to my head, but didn't want it just to be from my head, but I uh, got some other ideas as well. And so the list that I came up with is liberty, freedom, equality, self-government, opportunity, diversity, unity, democracy, and individuality and so you can compare and contrast that to the list of stuff that you came up with we're going to come back to this later and i'll explain why i asked for this um, as we go through this passage we are going to continue as i said in the book of philippians we're nearing the end of the book of philippians um and um you can it, we're, we're looking at the series of commands that, that paul begins to give the church in, in philippi and, and we've looked at the, the these four real commands that, that kind of go together um but are but are also kind of individual commands that we we looked at the last four weeks where we talked about um rejoice in the lord always and, and and how we can lose our joy in times of trial be gracious let your graciousness be evident to all and how we can lose our graciousness in times of trial uh, about the, the the lord is near and how we can lose our hope in times of trial and difficulty and to be anxious about nothing but everything uh, to, to pray uh, and we talked about how we can lose our peace in times of trial um, and I had, I had quite a few people actually comment to me about last week just uh, the message really speaking to them if you so if you didn't hear the message last week um, it's one that, that really spoke to a lot of people and encourage you maybe to go back and listen to that one um, but, but we're gonna shift today um, and and there, there is actually a couple more commands that are a little bit different. So that's why I didn't include them in the four that we just talked about. But a couple more commands. And we're going to read both of those today. And so um, I'm going to invite someone else to read that. So Patty, if you want to take it from here. Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute. If there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace shall be with you. All right, thank you, Patty. So this is an interesting passage. Um, I knew it was coming up, I anticipated it, uh, and, and actually knowing it was coming up, I, I kind of thought through, I had, I really had like a third of the message in my head, um, and was going to talk to you about, talk to you about it, I was going to talk, you know, about how um, we, we, we come and um, we fill our minds with these things, and you know, I was going to go through each, each thing in the list, like, uh, what does true mean, what does pure mean, you know, look at the Greek word and, and, and talk about that, and, and what kind of things do we fill our minds with with each of these things, and I had some really good things I was going to say, I was excited to preach that message, but it's one of those times that as I was going through the passage and kind of digging deeper and studying it, like God uh, kind of led me down a different path, and, and, and I felt there's a better way to understand the passage. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I mean, so that's how I've always read this passage, read a lot, have it memorized. In fact, I'll use this passage, you know, if my mind, if my thought life is kind of going impure places or bad places, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll remind myself, whatever is pure, whatever is, is true, whatever is holy, think about these things. And, um, and or excellent praise, my holy is not even in there. But anyway, um, 
uh, like I'll, 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 I'll quote that to myself and remind myself of the things uh, that I'm supposed to be filling my mind with because that's the way I've always read this. And that's not a bad way to read this passage. I think you can definitely read it that way because it's obviously what it says. But, but as I was kind of studying it in the context of this letter that, that Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, I realized that maybe that's not the best way to understand that. So why, why do I say that? Well, what's interesting about this list that Paul does is so there's several times throughout Paul's letters that he has a list of, of um, virtues, a list of things that, that we should be doing. And I think, think of things like the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Right? There's lists like that of, of virtues or, or values that, that, that we should have. But what's interesting about this list is it's very unique amongst all of Paul's lists. When you look at the words that are in this list, they're, they're pretty different. In fact, there's eight words on this list, and of those, um, uh, Two, two of them, this is the only time in the whole New Testament that they're used. Like uh, uh, Matthew through Revelation is the only time they occur. Um, one, to- one of the words is the only time that Paul uses it in all his letters. You know, he wrote like a good like, third of the, of the New Testament, but this is the only time he uses it. And then two more of them um, are used a couple times in the New Testament, but, but are really rare words. And then one is a word that's used in the New Testament, but it's used in a very different sense. And so, so out of these eight words... Six of them are, are, are words that are really rare in the New Testament or seem out of place. Um, and so the question is, you know, why does Paul use all these unusual terms? Why in this list, why is this list so much different than his other list? Because if you compare his other lists, they'll have overlap and, a lot, and they'll be a lot more similar. So why is this one different? And I think um, to understand that, we have to, to look at something that we talked about with Philippi. So we talked about how Philippi was unique in Rome because Philippi was a Roman colony. Now, it wasn't the only Roman colony, but of the letters that we have uh, to, it was, it was one of the few places that was a Roman colony. What that meant is that most of the, the, the residents of, of Philippi were citizens of Rome. They had special um, privileges and, and, and rights that they had as, as Roman citizens, and they probably esteemed Rome probably more than any other uh, congregation they wrote to. Even, even the congregation of Romans, like, uh, it's likely that the Philippians even esteemed Rome, like um, the, the, the government, the empire, the, the, what, what it means to be Roman, more than maybe even the Romans, uh, the, the, the congregation that Paul was writing to, because they wouldn't have all been citizens. Um, and so what's interesting about this, this, this list is that the, this list is not so much the, the, the values or the virtues that Paul usually talks about, but this list would seem very at home in a list of Roman values and a list of, a list of Roman virtues. In fact, most people, uh, scholars who study this book, they, they, they can point to other lists um, and, and, and other, the works of other Roman philosophers and Roman writers that are more similar uh, to this one. And so, so these values that Paul seems to be, they're, they're really coming, these are Roman values more than they are biblical values. Now, I'm not saying that any of these things are unbiblical. Obviously, we look at this list, you know, true, pure, praiseworthy. These are, these are not unbiblical things, but they're just not the things that Paul usually t- talks about. And they are the things that Romans would have said, these are Roman values. These are things that are important to us and our culture. And so as I approach this passage, rather than approaching it from, the, the, from looking at what these Roman values are and how we're supposed to fill our minds with that, I don't think that's necessarily what Paul was getting at. I think if he were writing this letter to us today as American Christians, that he can mer- very much be listing some of these American values that we talked about, things like freedom uh, and equality and, and uh, opportunity, those kinds of things. And so what I want to do is rather than look at all these, this list of things um, that Paul talks about is I want to look at how do we approach our values as Americans? Because I think that's what we're, Paul's really getting at here with, is how do you approach your values as a Roman citizen? So, so how do we approach our values as, as Americans? And I think the first thing that we see here is that Paul does list these values. And so what we learn from this is that we do not reject all of our values. We do not reject all the values of our culture. As Christians, we know that we are to be distinct from the world around us. We know that we are to be different from the world around us. As Paul said earlier, our citizenship is in heaven. And so sometimes as Christians, we can have an isolationist attitude to the culture and the world around us. Like we see 
the evil out around us. We see, we look around, and we see the bad things, the evil that's in the world around us, um, and, and, and we want to withdraw from that. We want to cut ourselves off from that. Like an extreme example of this would be Amish society, you know, where they really withdraw. They won't even you know, have technology or anything like that. Now, now, obviously, most of us don't go that far, but, but we have areas that we cut off, right? And this comes from good intentions, right? This, this comes from ideas like Paul. In another letter in Galatians, he says, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And so we can take verses like that and we can think, well, I'm supposed to be dead to the world. The world's supposed to be dead to me. And so I'm going to cut myself off from that. I'm going to push that away. And I'm going to be separate from the culture around me. And, we're going to, and we remove ourselves. And so we, we, we isolate ourselves. We kind of put ourselves in this little Christian bubble where we, we only have Christian media in our lives. We, we only have Christian friends. We, 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 we go to church and, and, and we engage in Christian things um, and, and kind of cut off the world around us. And there's a degree that it's good for us to, to, to make sure that we have boundaries of the world around us, that we're not you know, allowing things that are going to influence us um, in, in bad ways or, 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 or in sinful ways or, or away from God into our lives. But at the same time, what Paul is showing us is that there's good things that we have to take away from our culture as well. That, 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 that we don't just completely cut ourselves off from our culture, that there's values and things like that that come from our culture that, are, that can be good. Right? Um, and ultimately, all these good things come from God. Everything good in the world comes from God. Um, and, and the gospel message is that God created the world good. And so, so these values that are good values, they, they ultimately come from him, but that sin distorted them. And so in the same way that in, in, in the lives of, of, of people um, apart from God, that, that there's, there can be good in their lives, but that good ultimately comes from God. And sin has distorted that good. And so the same thing is true of a culture. There's good that can be there that, that comes from God, but yet sin can distort that goodness. And so what Paul is saying to the, the Philippians is, as he lists these Roman values, what I think the way that we apply to us as we look and examine our American values is, is look at these things, learn from them, grow in them, and, and, and think on them. But we also have to be careful with them. All right, so I said in my my uh, my, my message, uh, or sorry, my message, so I said that this message that was in my head, my, my message was going to be about, like, fill your mind with these things. And, and actually, you know, as we've gone through the book of Philippians, I've, I've commented a couple times on this this word for mind, like, you know, have the same mind as Christ, like, think about these things, but it's, just, it's like the same Greek root. And before I really looked at this passage of the Greek, I kind of assumed, I bet that that is the same Greek word, and, and that it's talking about, like, you know, put these things in your mind. And that's part of what we do is to have the this, this same mind and, and, and the shared mind is to fill our minds with these things, and, and that's part of what it means to have the same mind. And then I came to the passage, and I, and I realized in Greek, that's not what it says. It's a different Greek word. In fact, this word doesn't mean so much to, to like, think on, like, fill your mind with, but it's, a, it's this word that would be, like, calculate evaluate reason it's where we get actually the word logical uh, uh, from and everything it's, it's think through these things consider these things so so it's not so much that that, that when Paul is saying you know whatever is, is true whatever is, is pure um, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy you know all these things that he lists um, it, it's not so much that he's saying fill your mind with these things but he's saying think about these things consider these things. And so I think to us, if we're, we're applying this to our values that we have as, as Americans, he's saying, you know, you know freedom and, and, uh, and opportunity and, and diversity and equality um, and honor and justice, uh, consider these things. Consider these things. And so the second thing that we get from what Paul is teaching the Philippians here and in a way teaching us is that we evaluate all the values of our culture. We evaluate all of the values of our culture. Think on them. Consider them. Think about them. Because some of these values are going to be very close to biblical truth, right? So, so an American value we have is, is equality. And, and equality is, is something I'd say is, is, is a very close to a biblical value. That that's, really is a biblical value. That all men are created equal. That, that all people are made in the image of God. And so they have equal value, equal worth before God. And so, so that fits very nicely with this American value of equality. Some of these, as we consider them, are going to be close to biblical values. So, so when we talk about justice as Americans, I say justice 
is, is an American value. But when we talk about just as American, what we often mean by justice is we mean we want things to be fair, we want things to be right, we want treat people to be treated the same. We often mean it in like kind of a, of a legal context of, of, of people being treated right or the, the right thing being done. Um, and, and, and that's actually very close to the biblical notion of justice. Now, the biblical notion of justice is more about what is wrong being made right, I, I, I would say. Uh, but, it's, but it's a very similar idea. There's a lot of overlap there when we consider the American value of justice and, and, and hold it up through a biblical lens. But sometimes, as we consider things, we, we realize that there's, there, the, while it can appear that there's a similarity, there, there actually can be quite a bit of difference, right? And so um, one, an example I'd use for this is this American value that we have is of freedom. And you say, well, freedom's all over in the Bible. What do you mean by that? Well, well as, 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 free, as, as Americans, as Americans, when we talk about freedom, um, we, we often mean it to, to the, that freedom means I can do whatever I want, um, right? That's like when you were a kid and you would like poke at your brother or sister. Poke, 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 poke. And they say, stop poking me, stop poking me, poke, 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 poke. And they stop poking me and you'd say, what would you say? You'd say, uh, I don't have to stop. It's a free country, right? You meant it's a free country. I can do whatever I want. And that's oftentimes what we mean when we talk about freedom as Americans. I have the freedom to do whatever I want. Um, right, and that, that comes out of our history, right? Like uh, we, uh, we we came here that you know, like the people, the very first people to colonize here, they wanted freedom from government oversight so they could worship as they wanted. Um, the colonists wanted freedom from from taxes that that they didn't have a say in. They wanted uh, freedom from from those taxes to be able to do another. They wanted free freedom from governmental controls, and especially in the sense of of religious freedom. And it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. I'm not saying it's a bad thing at all. But what I'm saying is when we, we hold that up and we consider it and we think on it and we look at the biblical notion of freedom, we see that there's actually not a lot of overlap there. Because the biblical notion of freedom has, doesn't really have anything to do with government control. It doesn't even have a, 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 the, the, the idea of, of being free to worship God however you want. But when we look at the biblical notion of freedom, what, what the biblical notion of freedom is, is really freedom from the bondage of sin. Freedom. From the, from the bondage of, of, of um, the, the things that rule our lives, the sin and the death and the evil that rules our lives, that G in Jesus we are free from those things. And so it's not a freedom to be able to do whatever you want, but it's a freedom that I don't have to do what I want. Right? In myself, I desire to do things. I desire, you know, I, I might desire uh, uh, someone who's not my spouse. I might, I might desire to get revenge on someone. I might, I might desire to cheat to get ahead. I desire to do those things. And in myself, I don't have uh, the ability to overcome. Like I, I want to overcome those things, but I, maybe even, but I, but I don't have the power to. But in Christ, I have the freedom to be able to, to not do what I want, but to the freedom to obey God, to do what He wants me to do. And so that's the biblical notion of freedom. And so we can see it's quite distinct from the American notion of freedom. Now, once again, I'm not saying the American notion of freedom is a bad thing. I'm just saying it's not the same thing as the biblical notion of freedom. And so, so when we consider these things, when we evaluate these things, we, we, we recognize them and we process through them. We, we look at them through a certain lens. And this is what Paul gets at in this. So now in this passage that, that we read, that Patty read for us earlier, um, there's a parallel that I don't think we always pick up on. I actually didn't pick up on it um, uh, until I was studying this a little bit more closely. But if you look at it, so finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, uh, all of that stuff, consider these things. Consider these things. And what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things so in other words there's a parallel like that that the, the values of your culture these roman values consider them and these these things that you've received from me and when, when paul talks about things received from him when we look at other passages and we talk about receiving and passing on what he's really talking about is the things of the gospel but that's what the biggest thing the Philippians are receiving from is the things of the gospel. They, 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 that is the very first thing they received from him. That's the things they heard from him as he wrote them letters, as he spoke to them, right? is the things of the gospel. And he says, those things practice these things. So your, 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 your cultural values, consider them. Gospel, gospel things practice these things. Now, imagine it's Anne's birthday. 
And I go up to her and I say, you know what, honey? I considered getting you a gift. It's probably not going to go over very well, right? But if I bring her a gift, if I bring her something, that, that might fill her heart with gladness, might fill her heart with joy, right? And so the point of this is, is what means more, considering something or practicing doing something? And we say doing something. And so in this parallel, Paul is lifting up the, the, the thing that we're supposed to practice, the gospel values, the gospel things that we live out, um, that, that he's lifting those up above our cultural values. In other words, uh, the, the, the gospel guides the way we live. The gospel guides the way we live. The good news that Jesus came to fix our broken world, that he died and he rose on the cross so that we can experience a new creation, that, that all parts of ourselves and our culture can be remade, reborn, and redone. That that, that that is what comes primary and first. And so while our cultural things are not bad, our cultural values are not bad, we should, we should hold on to those, we should think about them, but we filter these cultural values we, we, we consider, we filter them through the kingdom values that we practice, the gospel values that we practice and live out. Our cultural values get practiced through uh, our, our, uh, our, our kingdom values, our gospel values. And why is that? Is because the kingdom of God is greater than the kingdom of America. Or in the case of the Philippians, the kingdom of God is greater than the kingdom of Rome, the empire of Rome. The kingdom of God is greater than the kingdom of America. And, and this is what Paul, in, in the context of Rome, has said to the Philippian Christians several times. Right? He reminded them, your citizenship, you're, you're Roman citizens, but your citizenship, first and foremost, you're citizens of heaven. Right? Be citizens worthy of the calling that you have received. These are, these are things that we talked about earlier in this letter to, 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 to Philippi Christians. He's not, he's not denouncing their citizenship to Philippi. He's not saying that's of nothing, that's valueless, that's worthless. But he's saying, first and foremost, you're a citizen of a greater kingdom first. And he says to us, as Christians in America, you are citizens first and foremost of heaven. You're, you're a citizen of the kingdom of God before you're a citizen of, of America. And so your values that come to you as an American, these, these American values, they must be filtered through the kingdom of God, through the values that you have as a citizen of heaven, because the kingdom of God is greater than the kingdom of America. Of America. I actually really just started to say America. All right. Um, you know, Many of us as Americans would say, well, that America is the greatest country ever, greatest nation ever. But many of Philippi would have said, Rome is the greatest empire ever. And Rome is no more. And one day America will be no more. Now, I'm not calling for America, the end of America. I'm not like, this isn't America bashing. This is just a fact that one day America, just like the Roman Empire is no more, one day America will be no more. But the kingdom that we are citizens of, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus, the kingdom of God, will last forever. It is an eternal kingdom, something that no kingdom of man can claim. And so, so Paul reminds uh, the, the Philippian Christians, well, you don't reject the values of the earthly kingdom that you're a part of. You consider them in light of the eternal kingdom that you will always be a part of. So the same thing is true for us as well. And why is that important for us? Is because I think sometimes as we love our country, as we appreciate the good things for our country, as we cherish these values that we have as Americans, is that we can sometimes begin to, to instead of, of, of recognizing the, the, that God's kingdom is up here and the kingdom of America is, is, is here in our lives, we can, can begin to bring them get together and conflate the true, the two. And let me give you an example of this. So... Um, as I was preparing this message, I came across um, this picture here. And it has this, you know, nothing wrong with this picture. In, in one sense, it's just an American flag with a Bible verse. Um, and the Bible verse says, um, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So, so in the context with this, this verse juxtaposed with this picture, what does it mean? Well, if you're just looking at this and you're not considering... The values of America, you would look at this and you would say, oh, what this is saying 
is that God's Spirit is upon the land of America, and that's why we have freedom in America. And we would mean it probably in the way that we have the American value of freedom because we have this juxtaposed with the American flag, is that, that because God's Spirit is upon America, we have freedom from government overreach, freedom um, from, from, from government control, and probably particularly in the area of, of, of our religious freedom and, and everything. So, what's wrong with that? Well, let me ask this. When we think about, when we consider the value of freedom through the lens of our eternal kingdom, through the gospel message that we're supposed to practice, when we consider the value of freedom through that, is everyone in America free? No. No. In fact, the majority of Americans don't have biblical freedom. They still live in slavery to themselves. They still live in slavery to their desires and to their flesh. They still live in slavery to the prince of the power, uh, power of the air. They, they don't live in biblical freedom. They may have freedom from government uh, overreach, from government oppression, but they don't live in biblical freedom. And by contrast, you know, I can pick many countries in the world, but just for example, we'll, we'll pick our brothers and sisters, our, brother, our, our Christian brothers and sisters in, in communist China. Do they have political freedom? No, they don't. Their government is very tyrannical. They, they can be arrested for, for worshiping Jesus. And yet, do they have biblical freedom? Yeah. And in fact, Paul was writing this verse under a government that would be more similar to communist China's government than to America's government. And so this, this verse is not talking about a nation so having God's spirit upon it so they experience political freedom. What he's saying is that when God's spirit comes upon us, when it leads us to repentance, when it leads us to faith in Christ, that it sets us free. And so it doesn't matter the oppression around us because what gives us freedom is ultimately God's spirit. And so when we recognize this gospel truth, this, is, this sets us free no matter, no matter if we live in, 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 in free America or if we live in, 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 in uh, communist China. That the spirit of the Lord is what ultimately brings us freedom, not any government. And so going back to this picture, I think the problem with it is that it seems to equate the kingdom of America with the kingdom of God. It's saying that the, the kingdom of America, the government of America that allows us to, to worship how we want or do what we want is what gives us freedom. That's not the case. What ultimately gives us freedom is our king, our King Jesus, that we serve. And so we have to be careful as Americans. This is just one example, but this is something I see in the American church, and I think it can be an issue is where we, where we equate these two kingdoms, where we, 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 we conflate them together when we're supposed to recognize and evaluate the kingdom of America through the lens of the kingdom of God. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a couple more things I'd say with this um, as we consider these values, a couple more uh, things, problems that this kind of, of uh, can lead to and I think that we need to look at and examine. So, um, uh, the first thing I want to look at is, so, so I, I, I asked Roichi, and I just sent him an email, I didn't give him the context about why I was asking him or anything like that. I said, just for my message on Sunday, can you give me a list of values, as, uh, Jap uh, of Japanese values? And, and he said, actually, is, uh, what comes to his mind first is that in every classroom, in every school gym, and judo dojo, there's these plaques on the wall, and these are the mottos on them. And he said, integrity, loyalty, filial uh, piety, so like, um, devotion to one's family he says that goes beyond love and respect for one's parents he put that in parentheses so I'll, I'll read that um, it, righteousness and justice respect honesty diligence gratefulness and kindness so these are Japanese values um, I, I also uh, got on Facebook Messenger and I messaged Osmar you know missionary support in Peru many are familiar with him so so a Peruvian man I, I, I said um, what are some values of Peru and this is the list that he gave me Family, faith, diversity, hospitality, modesty, solidarity, collectivism, and perseverance. So let's look at all three of these lists together. So, so American values, um, Japanese values, and Peruvian values. Uh, which of these lists 
is most biblical? And none of them. None of them is more biblical. Like, all of these things are good things. All these things are, are things that I think you could point to in the Bible as, as um, you know, like there's, there's some biblical values reflected in these things. But I wouldn't say any one of these countries of uh, values are necessarily more biblical than the others. So, can Christians from other places learn from our values as Americans? Very much so. We've been very blessed in America because of our Christian uh, uh, heritage and because of, of the material wealth that we have that we've been able to send missionaries out around the world and they've been able to go places. And then using that, that lens of American values that they have, they've been able to, to impact and share some of those values with people and just had a positive impact in other places in the world. And so, so yes, other countries, other Christians can learn from Americans' values. But can we, as American Christians, learn from the values of our Christian brothers and sisters in other countries? Yeah. Look at this list. Look at these lists again. You know, I'd say uh, this, this uh, commitment to family, this feeling of uh, piety, I think that that's a biblical value that we lack in our culture, respect is a biblical value that we lack in our culture, and yet as we interact with our uh, Christian brothers and sisters from Japan, we, as American Christians, can learn from that. When we, when we, we interact with, with our, our Christian brothers and sisters in, in Peru, I look at this, this um, uh, uh, collectivism, this, this uh, and I know that, that that can get into big things. I'm not like, advocating or no, no, we need to become socialists or communists or anything like that, but just that as Americans, we can be very individualistic and, and not... Uh, uh, community-minded uh, enough, and I think that we can learn as Christians from our, our brothers and sisters in Peru of, of the, this collectivism of, of uh, hospitality. It's not something I say we have a great value on as Americans and, and that we can learn from this. And my, so my, my point in this is just that I think that, that sometimes because we love our country and because we recognize these values as we have, we can see ourselves as as. You know, American Christians, we're, we're, a little bit, we're a little bit up here, and the, 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 our brothers and sisters around the world are, are a little bit down here. We may not say that, but I think that we can sometimes think that a little bit, right? Because we send out missionaries, because we do these things, that, that we're going out to them. But I think we have to very much have this mindset that we're going out to them, we're, we're, we're sharing our values, we're preaching the gospel first and foremost because we practice the gospel first. But as we practice the gospel and consider our values, we also consider the values of the people we've preached the gospel to. We consider the values of our brothers and sisters, and we evaluate them against our values, and we say, biblically, gospelly, what are the values that God is trying to teach us? One more verse to read that goes along with this. Revelation 7, 9, 10. After this, I looked... And behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their heads, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So which nation is unique here? Which nation does God love the most? Sometimes people say America is a Christian nation, and what I'm going to say might be controversial, but I don't really think it's that controversial. There's only been and only ever will be one Christian nation on earth, and that is the kingdom of the Lamb who sits on the throne, who has brought salvation to the world. The one who people from every tribe and tongue and language worship. Now, every nation that's existed has had varying degrees of influence from that. Say, America has been influenced by, by that, that kingdom of God in, in very good ways, and, 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 and maybe more so than other nations have, but maybe not more so than all other nations, that's to be debated, but definitely more so than a lot of nations have for sure. That's, all, that's also not to be debated. But all of these nations ultimately are a mixed bag of things from God and things in the kingdom and the things of men. They're composed of, of, of people that, that, are, that are influenced by the kingdom of God and composed, and composed by people that are sinful. None will fully embrace the values of the kingdom of God. None are capable 
of fully embracing the values of the kingdom of God. Now don't mistake me, God has blessed us in many ways in America. He has used the church in America and the blessing we have to bring the gospel to many people, and that's a really good thing. I'm not at all bashing America. I'm not at all saying that, that, that we need to like somehow form one world government or anything like that. If you're hearing any of that in this, I know there's so much rhetoric tied up when we, t- we talk about this stuff. All I'm trying to say is preach what, 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 what I think the, the word teaches us about nations of, of people is that God loves them all the same. God does not love America or American Christians any more than he loves Canadian Christians or Ethiopian Christians or Iranian Christians or Colombian Christians. God loves them all the same. I am not trying to in any way belittle America, but I'm trying to make sure that we properly exalt the kingdom of God, exalt the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that we shouldn't love our country, that we shouldn't be devoted to America and our our values. I'm saying be devoted to America, but be devoted to the kingdom of God first. Love America, but love the kingdom of God even more. And most importantly, recognize that you are an American, except for a few of you that are watching that aren't Americans. You apply your own nation there. But you are an American, and you have been shaped by American values. And, and, and to, to hold on to those, not just push all of those away, but to critically think about those values and examine them through the rubric of the gospel that you live out. And see which ones fall in line with that gospel and which ones are lacking. And consider them. And see how they've impacted your thinking. And work to live out the gospel according uh, or live out those values according to the gospel of the kingdom. Because what's most important for us as believers, it's not the stars and the stripes, it's not Washington, D.C., it's not New York City, it's not, it's not uh, the, the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. What's most important to us as believers is the body and blood of Christ. It is what gives us our identity and our values even more than the the identity and values that our country gives us. And so that's what I want us to reflect on as we move into this time of communion. So I want you to, to reflect on what values, what identity comes as people who have been bought with the body and blood of Christ. And so Joe and Kel, if you guys want to come on up um, and I'm going to go ahead and and sign off for just a minute um, while uh, Kale plays music and Joe distributes these things. If you're you're visiting with us, if you never, or this is your first time back, um, we we have these single serve uh, cups that include a wafer and juice. You can just send one person up from each group to come receive those and uh, tell how many you need for your group and take those back and then hold them. Um, And then I'll pop back up on the screen and we will take those all together.
After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one can number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their heads, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Jesus, we do thank you for the blessings that we have as Americans. We thank you that there are many who have, who have given their lives and sacrificed so that we can be here together today and freely worship you, freely take this communion. God, we do not take that for granted or take that lightly, and we are thankful for that. But even more so than that, we are thankful for the sacrifice that you gave. That on that cross, you gave yourselves so that we could be part of a kingdom that is even greater than the nation of America. And so we take this bread and we say, thank you for your body that has made us a part of something more. And God, we know that there are many people who have spilled their blood so that we can be here and drink this cup together. And we're thankful for their sacrifice. But God, we know that that sacrifice ultimately points us to you, the perfect sacrifice. The sinless one who gave himself and that, God, that our freedom ultimately, or we're thankful for the sacrifice of those, or we're thankful for the freedom we have to worship you, that our freedom ultimately comes from you. And that we share in that freedom, not just with brothers and sisters in America, but brothers and sisters around the world, even the ones who aren't free to worship as they like this morning, that, that we share in the freedom of the gospel, the freedom of the good news of Jesus, and that we are united with them in a great kingdom. So we take this cup and we say thank you for that. And so God, I pray that you would help us to see our values as Americans right. God, that we would not look despairingly or take the things that we have, the blessings that we have in our country for granted, that we would appreciate those values and those things that you have taught us by being Americans, but that we also would not esteem America too high, that we would consider those values and that we would recognize that as great or wonderful as they may be, God, that they are subordinate to your kingdom. That we would evaluate and consider the values that we have as Americans through the lens of your kingdom. And that as, even as we consider those things, we would continue to practice your gospel, continue to preach your gospel, continue to live out your gospel, and evaluate our values through it, God. May your gospel be what gives us our identity more than anything else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace and enjoy the rest of your day. I know I'll be enjoying the rest of my day. Bye.